Hey everyone, sorry that we're not all together in Northlight. Just wanted to say hi in person before I got started. Thanks for coming to my presentation. I would be teaching a concentration called Integrating Digital Processes. Uh, this class was intended for intermediate or advanced makers to learn computer-aided design and manufacturing, um, but to really focus on integrating these processes into an ongoing craft or art or design practice. So in an effort to speak to the content of the class, um, I'm going to discuss three different ways that I see craftspeople and artists using digital processes. And I'll illustrate this with examples from my own work and my own process. Um, broadly speaking, the three categories that I'm going to talk about are digital processes for direct manufacturing in the studio, um, digital processes that are integrated into a broader craft practice, and digital processes that fully transform one's craft practice and allows, uh, allows an artist to do work that would be really unachievable otherwise. Uh, digital processes for manufacturing. This is using digital tools to make objects where there's a straight and direct workflow from the design to the manufacturing process to a finished uh, product in that order. My example is this butter dish design. Um, this object starts out uh, being modeled in a, a 3D design software program called Fusion 360. Once the design is all worked out, I create the file that is going to actually um, run the tool that, that manufactures this object. Uh, in this case, it's a CNC router. Uh, here is a little video of a simulation that the program is doing. Um, but with a process like this, the, uh, what I do in the computer is really a direct translation of, of what is going to happen in the real world when I go and make this object with the CNC router. It's really just sort of like a one-to-one -one, um, process. Uh, here are just a couple process shots of kind of what this object looks like uh, at various stages. Although it definitely involves a little bit of cleanup to get it to its finished state, some handwork, um, you know, and actually applying finish, basically this is a machine-made product. Another example of this workflow are these marquetry coasters. Um, in this case, I'm using a laser cutter to cut the wood veneer uh, and also to cut the substrate. Um, I don't think this is the most interesting use of digital processes, but when I think about the incredible need that we have to move toward local economies, I'm definitely encouraged by the thought of individual craftspeople and small businesses using digital tools to make more of the products that we use in daily life. Now we'll look at how digital tools can be integrated into a broader and more complex process. Um, one of the misconceptions I had about digital fabrication before I started using these tools is that it would always leave a visual imprint. Uh, I saw so much work that looked like it was created by a computer, I thought that aesthetic was endemic to the technology somehow. Uh, but I have come to see digital tools as really no different from any of the jigs, fixtures, fences, um, etc. that I use in any complicated fabrication project. Um, you know, you're not aware of a table saw fence when you look at a well-made piece of furniture, and I think the same actually can be said of a 3D printer or a CNC router if it's used intentionally as part of a larger process. So the example that I have to give you is this uh, pewter shot glass design, um, and the cup is has no foot, but it is weighted so that it will kind of roll around on the table surface. Um, this uh, object also started in a in a 3D as a 3D model, and in this case, I had to make a lot of different prototypes to kind of get the weight right and get the action right. Digital processes were definitely useful in designing this cup, but where they really changed my process actually was in designing and making all the um, the different mold components. You can see in this cross section how there is a plug that goes down into the interior of the cup. Uh, that allowed me to cast a kind of thin rubber shell that went through there. All the different components from the model to the vents to this little retaining ring, um, they all fit together in a way that was just incredibly convenient and incredibly clean um, and also allowed me to use the expensive uh, high temperature silicon rubber that I'm using really efficiently, um, having the mold actually fit the cup shape. 
Uh, so here's the first pour, which is going to cast the interior of the cup and the rim of the cup. And there's a little shelf built into the um, into the mold form there that prevented the rubber from uh, running past the rim of the cup. Uh, after that shelf was removed, I could do a second pour uh, from the other side to cast the outside of the cup. Uh, there's that little retaining ring, and you can see it keys into both the sprue on the cup and also the vents and also the mold form. Uh, there it is all together. Second pour. And here's all the mold components uh, when, when they've been disassembled. And uh, here's what the cup looked like when it was all cleaned up and finished. I think this project is a good example of how digital processes can be used to support a more general process like pewter casting. Um, the digital tools are not driving the design. They are simply making my life easier, allowing me to have more control and precision and to use my time and my materials more efficiently. There are cases, however, when digital tools allow creators to do things that would just be impossible otherwise. Um, my entry point into using these tools was because I had a technical woodworking problem to solve that I just couldn't do any other way. So here's a brief synopsis of that problem and the solution. Um, I've been using wood veneer for many years to create uh, complicated patterns and surface designs on furniture and woodwork. And even though this work has actually captivated me for a long time, and I've been really interested in uh, you know, what is possible visually in two dimensions, um, at heart, I'm a th three-dimensional designer. And so I was always kind of irritated that um, due to the nature of the marketry process and what, you know, how I learned to do veneering, that I was limited to you know, to flat surfaces, or um, if not flat surfaces, to single curving surfaces. Um, so like here's a sculpture that has kind of a single curve in it. What I really wanted though was to be able to use these marquetry surfaces on a three-dimensional form that had a compound curving surface. Um, there is a problem though, which is that veneer as a material doesn't stretch or compress at all. So to get a double curving surface, you have to actually alter the surface geometry uh, somehow by shrinking it or expanding it. Um, the way I started uh, with this box here, which has a, a double curving surface on the lid, um, was to start with a flat sheet of veneer and just start removing material, basically cutting darts of material away so that um, there was a little room for that veneer to compress as it went around the compound curving surface. Um, here's another example uh, that illustrates that better. Um, you can see the edges of this hexagon have some material removed. Those little slivers have been taken out. And that allows that veneer to co compress around the domed he hexagon that you see here. And so by the time I got here, I, what I was realizing is that I needed a way to actually not just shrink the surface in some places, but to actually shrink it in some places and expand it in others. So that's when I switched over to a digital workflow. Um, here's the computer model of a compound curving plane. Um, and from this one model, I'm able to derive a lot of different uh, important components to the, the panel that I'm going to try to create here. This is a bending form that's milled with the CNC router. Um, then I am creating a, a formed panel by dividing that surface into smaller constituent parts that I can virtually flatten and cut with a laser cutter. So this is what the flat pattern looks like. Um, and here's a little video of these pieces coming together. And what you can see is that um, when I attach these edge to edge, they don't form a flat sheet anymore. They, um, they form a curving plane. And in this case, uh, I'm making a basically a compound curving plywood panel. So I've cut pieces out that run uh, lengthwise on this panel and also ones that uh, run cross grain. Um, here you can see uh, the two different laminations uh, in, in the background and the foreground. So now I repeat the process with the decorative surface. Um, here are the, the pieces ready to be cut on the laser cutter. And uh, here they are uh, getting cut out. And what you can see if you look closely is that uh, these are not true diamonds anymore by any means. They're actually heavily distorted. And again, when I start to put them together, uh, they tessellate into a compound curving plane, not into a flat plane. 
Um, so by, by getting the geometry um, of the marquetry surface pretty close before I actually glue it down, I'm able to then put everything in the vacuum bag and glue up this panel that has a, a very extreme uh, curve to it and have marquetry that perfectly fits over that curve. Um, I hope this presentation has given you a sense of what's possible with digital processes and also um, how I've used them in my work. Uh, if you want to see more of my work or you want to get in touch, please find me at my website or on Instagram. Um, and I hope that you are all well and that you stay well and that you stay safe. And I really look forward to seeing you at Penland sometime in the future. Thanks so much. Hello, Penland. Uh, my name is Sean Hibma Cronin, and I am an artist and furniture maker in the Bay Area in California. I was lucky enough to teach a steel sculpture class at Penland um, in the Iron Studio in the summer of 2018 and was scheduled to teach this year in 2020, but COVID. Um, so luckily enough, uh, the wonderful folks at Penland have scheduled the class for next year, 2021, the fall concentration. And I cannot wait um, to, to head back out there and see everybody. So. Um, this is going to be a quick survey of a lot of my work. I have kind of a problem editing things down, so bear with me. This is going to be quick. Um, please feel free to reach out to me about anything specific if you have any questions, and I can go into it further. So right off the bat, um, I like to show this slide because it's not on my grandpa, my hero, Grandpa Sydney. But you can see in the background what would be my future studio, and that's me in some sweet pajamas there, the 80s. Um, that was an active Navy base, which is uh, now no longer. Um, I've been in the space there on the right. I've been in the space for 10 years and it's been a wonderful space. So my grandpa not only started me off building early on and left me with kind of a appreciation for making things and fixing things, um, but he also left me his tools, which have been a huge, um, huge, uh, you know, thing of pride for me. And um, I've, I've expanded on the collection and, and uh, I'm a tool nerd. Um, I really like making my studio just so because having the right tool at the right time, the right material just makes things, once you get into a rhythm, things go really quickly and um, natural, uh, you know, happy accidents happen all the time. The pieces almost kind of fall together. Um, you can see my studio has a lot of stuff going on, which I kind of like to keep it that way. It's packed, um, stuff mocked up, stuff, you know, on hold for the right time. There's a 10-year project, a three-year project in there. There's a lot of shorter ones, quick turnaround. Um, it's a little bit of everything, and it keeps things fresh. So jumping way back, um, this is a piece I did at CCA early on. This is a kind of an intro into the wood shop. I studied furniture, and I studied sculpture at uh, California College of the Arts. And this was um, just to get oriented in the wood shop. I built this three-foot-long working egg beater based off of my mom's egg beater um, that I took apart. <laughs> I later built um, this coffee table to kind of further the exploration of gears and kind of just just to see the motion and, and, and hear the noise. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of fun. Later I built um, this piece. This is Abigail the giraffe. Um, really exploring what scale does. Um, something that's much larger than you is 14 foot tall and I just wanted to really take advantage of the tall ceilings in the gallery and uh, work big and quick and it's almost like a 3D sketch, uh, first built in wood then later in steel. Continuing with the animal theme, I built this the next year when I took a machining class. Um, I learned how to use a mill and a lathe in the metal shop and made this bending, articulating caterpillar light with acrylic and LEDs and brass and um, it was a really fun, very challenging, very, very kind of repetitive muscle memory piece, you know, to kind of like learn how to work the dials on the, on a, on a bridge port. Um, this is my first commission at TCA. I built a shovel for um, some friends property up in St. Helena. Um, and the handle, the scale uh, is based off of the handle being a telephone pole. So you can see the scale there with people on the right. A lot of fun. I, I way undercharged for this thing and nearly killed myself, but um, I'm hoping that this piece made it through the recent fire that's up there. Unfortunately, I know some people that lost their properties, and I feel so bad for everybody in California dealing with these fires. Uh, all over the country dealing with these fires. It is not, it's not a good thing. So 
take care of yourself and be safe, people. Um, all right, jumping back in. This piece was done in the furniture program. This is a a tool barrow, um, tool cabinet, wheelbarrow, you know, cabin of curiosity. The sides would fold down and it would show off this collection of unique uh, vintage tools that were, you know, before my generation and kind of a little mysterious and kind of fun for that aspect. Um, I really love vehicles and I love the, you know, the playful side of, of uh, custom vehicles. Um, this one is a desk that you can use while at school. You actually turn the front of the desk and it turns the front wheels. You're kind of steering your education if you want to, you know, be a little too on the nose. Um, but yeah, a lot of fun. I use this while at CCA and would uh, cruise around the halls. Um, this was a larger piece that um, that actually uses pressurized air and airbags front and back to raise and lower. It's kind of a, a, a low rider, chaise lounge, soapbox racer, um, kind of like what, you know, what um, a kid would dream about doing with like a grown up budget or grown up tools. Um, <laughs> so yeah, this is another vehicle technically, um, this is called Perch. Um, it's really just about gaining some perspective and changing your view on something and just taking a little break and thinking and reflecting and um, yeah, it's a very meticulous piece. Uh, there's uh, cast aluminum wood seat slats um, and wheels and steps and it's very, it's very, uh, yeah, that's very labor intensive, but uh, a lot of fun. Another vehicle. This is the Angler. You sit in that seat, crank the handle, and actually cast that that neck in and out. And um, it's like about, you know, um, teasing yourself, prompting yourself forward, like the bait of an idea, the light bulb above your head, trying to kind of egg yourself on, like catch that perfect idea as it floats by. Um, more vehicles. This is a uh, this is a piece that is about motion and power and and moving around. It turns like a tank. There's a motor on each wheel that runs actually along the rim and a big tooth gear on these 36 inch rims that I made at school, which was completely ridiculous. Um, this is my first commission in a public space. This was the um, a piece for Compass Books in the San Francisco airport. Um, the Freedom Press, this thing is a working printing press of my own design that prints the word freedom. Um, and uh, there's my niece in front of it, and my friends send me photos as they're traveling. It's the best thing. Um, just a kind of a reminder of the the freedoms that we take for granted as Americans and being able to travel nearly all over the world and you know, freedom of speech and freedom of the press and all that is just, um, we are very lucky to have these freedoms to exercise. So, uh, my van, my precious van, this is a 1963 Ford Falcon Deluxe Club Wagon or an Econoline body style. I love this thing. I've, um, I used it to move art around and then I decided to turn it into a sculpture and it now looks something like that. Uh, I've completely gutted it, cut the floor out, rebuilt the frame, swapped out um, the drivetrain and the suspension and the steering and the brakes and everything. Uh, it's now a turbo diesel with airbags and um, nearly, nearly done. Um, there it is now. I've had the opportunity to show this thing a number of times and it's been a pleasure um, kind of showing it in whatever its new state is and explaining how all these parts work and kids love it. It's just like... It's a lot of fun. I see no difference between that and my other sculptures. Um, in fact, I've done a number of pieces with the po the body parts that I've pulled off of it um, to create, you know, interesting wall sculptures that are kind of highlighting the frame that goes into these crusty old car parts. So um, this is a piece that was, you know, similar kind of an offshoot of that. This is a collection of ten years of my welding gloves that have been worn through, and uh, I just liked the gradient of you know, grunge and grit and rust and grease that are on them um, and showing the process and the kind of cyclical process, things never being finished. Um, another commission, this is a bench that is made out of faceted sheet metal, galvanized, dipped, and blended into this rock wall. I actually 3D scanned the rock wall to make the bench fit nicely. Um, very calculated piece. This is a very spur of the moment piece. I, I was invited to do a one day sculptural um, you know, installation in a park with the art escapist. This is at Montalvo in um, 
in California, an amazing place. And I just brought, I brought a mile of string and got there early and just started making a big mess and a big net. And I call this piece honey tangle. And it's just no decisions, just move, just, just work. And, um, later built another one on top of my studio and, um, jumped on it and it didn't kill me. Um, I've been doing a lot of these wireframe pieces. These are just kind of fun ex explorations of form and kind of wandering, kind of making shapes and sticking them places and seeing what th what things come out of it. A lot of pieces are, are uh, shapes are hidden in these forms, but work right off the table and just careful welds. Out of that came another commission. This is for uh, also for a, a different um, store in uh, the San Francisco airport. This is a series of iconic California birds done as planes, almost, you know, Wright brother era plane inventions. Um, and the, yeah, just really fun, big mobile piece. It's 20 foot long. And way on the far end there is a series of, or a couple of these um, small hummingbird pieces, which I later made a series out of um, all stainless steel. Uh, recently, I've been making these trophies for a um, this car race called the 24 Hours of Lemons, um, a play off of Le Mans. You should certainly look them up. It's a great way to get into actual car racing with a budget price. You're racing budget cars and just um, getting out there and having fun. So I built 240 of these things, and it nearly killed me. Um, but a lot of fun, and yeah, I'm... Go out there and win one of these things if you're lucky. Recently, I've been working with this guy, Sky Parker, um, amazing engineer. He designed this off-road wheelchair that has hand controls and um, goes like 40 miles an hour off-road on, on like single track mountain bike trails. Electric motor on the side there. And, uh, it's, it's really fast. <laughs> It's really fast and it turns really sharply and it's pretty crazy. Um, I've had the pleasure of finishing off this build with him and getting into all the details and um, yeah, we are very close to being done on that. So yeah, follow him, oh, Sky Parker one on Instagram <laughs> um, and yeah, it's a lot of fun. So this is the van in its current state. I'm still working on this thing, and it's very close to being done. And while I do that, I am also working on a few large public art pieces that are um, a few years in the making. This one is for Sam Leandro, um, and we'll have 2,000 of these little formed pieces running along and awning and up to um, kind of emulate a field of poppies and swarming monarch butterflies. And yeah. That's, that is a quick survey of all my work. Thank you so much for watching. Um, please uh, follow along on Instagram if you want to know more. Reach out if you have any questions. Um, my email is on my website, and I'm happy to share. Thanks so much. Um, everybody, take care of yourselves and those you care about. Hello, everyone. I'm Laura Wood. Thank you so much for joining me today for this presentation. I'm excited to share with you an overview of what I've been working on for the last couple of years. I was scheduled to teach the Fall 2020 course, Foundations in Form and Color. It's been rescheduled to Fall 2021, so if anyone's interested in building sculptural form and metal and adding color through powder coat and enamel, do check those details out at Penland's website when they become available. This is me for anyone who might be interested in the person behind the voice. I've been a full-time studio artist now for a little under 10 years. Uh, this body of work, the LWS Collection, is a limited production line that has been the foundation for my studio practice for several years now. This body of work is grounded in sculptural form and designed and engineered to fit and follow the lines of the body. So many of the earrings in this collection have a left and a right, and so many of the other pieces have a way of falling very naturally to the curves of the body. I've always been drawn to contemporary jewelry for the performative qualities of this type of work. I enjoy anything that you can put on that will shift or alter your daily experience. Uh, I love color. I love using color on my work and also in how I document these pieces. 
Photography has become increasingly important with how I share my work. Uh, most of the time, the first way anyone is ever going to see your pieces is first through image, especially now and uh, for the foreseeable future. And so I'll get into that a little bit later in my uh, presentation. I have several components to my creative practice. I spend a lot of time in the studio. I teach when my schedule allows, and I am a co-founder of Jewelry Edition. It's a web-based contemporary jewelry exhibition and pop-up experience. I co-founded this project with my friend and colleague, Kat Cole. We work with about four to six jewelry artists on a rotating basis, and we travel this group of work to places all over the country, including galleries, organizations, and alternative spaces. We are working with two collaborative writers this year, and we will be publishing content on our website uh, later in December of 2020. Do check out jewelryedition.com to see what we've got going on. In 2017, I joined this group of people to pursue uh, three years at the Penland School of Craft and the Resident Artist Program. For the last three years, I have been working on uh, incorporating enamel into my work and expanding my studio to uh, include very important pieces of equipment. Um, this time has been so important for being able to carve out space for continued development. Uh, something that I can balance alongside my production line and my business. Here are some pieces in progress. You can see there's a lot of variation in form and color. Uh, the first year and a half of the residency was really about casting a wide net and making many, many samples. The Space Between series is the first finished collection of work that has come from this time in the studio. Um, this entire collection of sculptural forms were made to embody the idea of transition and serve as loose interpretations of visual memories and life observation. So they are varied in form, they're varied in color, uh, some of them have relationships happening within one piece and also at times relationships with other pieces in the collection. I really see each and every one of these brooches as a, a launching point for an entire series. So I will definitely be using this specific collection as a catalog to come back to. Four of the pieces from the Space Between series were acquired by the Enamel Arts Foundation, and I'm including the link below for anyone who might want to look through their catalog of pieces. It's an incredible archive of contemporary enamel. Around the time I finished uh, the Space Between series, uh, we were sort of rounding out 2019. And I can't really move forward without acknowledging the impact that the pandemic has had on my practice, um, I mean, alongside the lives of everyone. Um, and for me, I uh, was having trouble sitting down and concentrating on anything for too long of a period of time. My mind has been really occupied with what's happening in the world. And to alleviate some of that anxiety, I decided I would make some very temporary, very ephemeral jewelry pieces. So I kind of began picking things from my surrounding and making these very temporary jewelry pieces and photographing them. Um, I decided I wanted to make more of these and I knew that I wanted to photograph them and that would be the way that they would sort of be in the world. So I contacted a local photographer who frequents the area, Mercedes Jelinek, and she agreed to work with me to photograph some of these very temporary, very quick jewelry pieces. This time with Mercedes was um, really a wealth of inspiration for me. I think um, this image series was the catalyst for so much of the work that I've been making recently. And I want to thank Mercedes for spending this day with me. And you can view this entire image series on laurawoodstudios.com uh, on my blog. After this, I had a lot of motivation to return to the studio, and I decided to give my focus over to making pieces um, that were a reference to my surroundings, a place where I'm spending a lot of my time in self-isolation. 
I also wanted to give myself the task of finding a focused color palette. I ended up pulling my color from the three mile radius that I visit every day. Um, it's springtime, so everything is coming alive, everything's blooming, and this served to be my reference for where I would pull color, texture, and sometimes even form. Here is a catalog of forms, uh, some examples of things in progress, uh, lots of enamel pieces coming together, uh, layers creating these mossy textures, using the copper mesh to build up forms and layer on the enamel to create these sort of lichen-y textures. Also bringing in some stones to match some of the colors in my surroundings and just generally building a catalog of forms that I could pull from for some of these uh, finished pieces. These components all came together to be the final uh, series that I will have completed here in the residency program under the title Perlius. And um, the name in itself means your regularly visited haunts, your frequented places. So I thought it fitting for um, the entire series to work under this title. Each piece is named for the mile marker where I pulled these textures and colors. So this one is mile marker 1.77. The jewelry comes alive when you get to see it on the body, and so I was really excited to be able to work with Lucy Plato Clark to photograph uh, this series on the body. We were able to shoot the work in the places that uh, inspired the pieces, and uh, we had a real focus on color and texture from beginning to end. These earrings, uh, mile marker 0 0.39, are moss inspired and uh, do have that signature flare that I like to add into my jewelry pieces, which is that it does curve there along the jawline. Um, it's really important that this work be wearable as well as visually striking. This is one of my very favorite pieces from the collection. It will join the other pieces from the space between with the uh, Enamel Arts Foundation. And one exciting thing that came about after uh, finishing this series, I had the images printed in large format prints. And um, so much of that detail that you can't really quite appreciate sometimes when even holding the piece. You can see so close up in some of these images. And so this is something I'm actually ruminating about um, as I plan for the next series of work. Um, I really want to see more pieces printed in large format photographs like this. I've actually got a show coming up in January and there's ample wall space. And so this is something that I plan to do a whole lot more of. But presently, I am actually in the middle of packing up my studio at Penland. I will miss it very much. It's been a wonderful space to grow and evolve and um, add very important aspects to my work. Um, so those are my samples all packed up, and I will be back in Asheville in just a few short weeks. I'll be heading there with my two cats and my partner, Thomas Campbell. Um, I want to give him a a thank you in this presentation for being so supportive of especially the last three years while I've been here at Penland and um, I think we both invite you to visit our studios in Asheville once we are set up. I do want to extend um, a big thank you as well to the Penland School of Craft for uh, giving me this time in the residency and also giving me the opportunity to teach in your facilities. Um, thank you so much, and if anybody has any questions, you can direct them to me at laurawoodstudios.com.